Hi. When I started working for City Tote in 1969, the industry was undergoing a period of change and growth. The 1960 Gaming and Betting Act had uh, changed the industry beyond recognition. Erstwhile illegal bookmakers and turf accountants were able to open licensed premises, betting shops, which they did throughout the country, where people could go in, place a bet or withdraw their winnings. And uh, that was quite a new departure and it, it, it was facilitated by uh, the invention, I suppose, of the uh, a wire service run by Tannoy and Company, which gave you live commentary from the track, from the racetrack. It was horse racing was a daytime activity, dog racing was at night. So all the betting shops broadcast this uh, commentary and updating the betting market from the track. And uh, they would get also uh, real-time results which I would then uh, as a boardman which is why I started out uh, write up on a chalkboard for display to the customers uh, of course there had always been gambling uh, uh, ever since time began actually uh, people gamed on various things, contests and fights, and races and so on. And I think that's pretty clear, even from archaeological evidence of gaming pieces and dice and stuff like that. But in the 18th and 19th century, uh, gaming was, was an illegal activity really. It was carried on uh, below the radar by people who set up events, sporting events, races, boxing matches, dog fights, cock fights, things like that, and attracted large crowds of people who would gamble on the results. And on the fringes of, the, of those large crowds would be all the uh, twilight trades, people who preyed on large crowds, like pickpockets and people selling alcohol and food and, uh, and maybe prostitutes and other kind of thugs of all kinds. Not surprisingly, that gave rise to a considerable amount of public disorder. By the 20th century, gambling had been more or less confined to horse racing and dog racing. I know that <coughs> I know that illegal uh, races and fights and dog fights take place today and are still. Uh, the occasion for gambling and disorder, but uh, they're in the minority, they're not mainstream events, and they're illegal and the police do uh, try to operate against them. But uh, in, the, uh, in the 20th century, as I say, it was mostly horse racing and dog racing. Now there are two kinds of people that gamble, those with too much money, and those with too little money, uh, by and large, uh, there are exceptions. Uh, but people that uh, have too much money are catered for by horse racing, by and large. Because you can attend the track, you can own a horse or two, uh, you can get involved in that way and you can also bet legally with a turf accountant with whom you have an account and you can only bet with them o over the phone but uh, you can you can d uh, do that from the comfort of your home 
Dog racing, on the other hand, is primarily a working class, a flat cap industry, and it's intended for the working classes. But of course, there aren't dog meetings going on locally everywhere every night, and people, not unreasonably, like to have a daily flutter. And uh, so there's a large gap in the market in the 20th century which is catered for by illegal uh, uh, illegal bookmakers who uh, would have agents called runners who would bring to them bets collected from working places like factories, mines, barracks, places where a large number of men would work and it's, it is mostly men we're talking about and uh, they would bring them to the illegal bookmaker who might be operating in a tavern and uh, the illegal bookmaker could uh, consolidate those bets and look at his assess his liabilities and his potential losses and offlay some of that through his no doubt legal uh, telephone connection to a turf accountant but that was illegal and it gave rise to a, a lot of crime because it attracted the attention of organised criminals who looked to provide protection or get a cut of the takings. The bookmakers themselves and the runners were moving around with quite large sums of money so they were a target for robbery and the police uh, were prepared often to look the other way and allow these illegal activities to go on provided they were bunged a couple of quid here and there so it gave rise to a lot of corruption and, and crime and the 1960 act was intended to uh, heal that corruption part of the object of the act no doubt was to create a legal industry which would no longer be a source for crime and corruption but uh, could be taxed and controlled properly by uh, the government and authorities. Um, anyway, what was happening in 1969 was that these small uh, operators, one-man bands, who had opened up all over the country were gradually being taken over by medium-sized companies, uh, bookmakers who were probably, well they had the means or they had the, uh, they had the business ability or probably they had better criminal connections. Uh, they were taking over the smaller bookmakers and medium-sized companies, two, three hundred shops were appearing. People like Ron Nagel, William Hill, Joe Coral, uh, the owners of Labrooks, those sort of people were taking over. And at the same time, those medium-sized companies were coming under the purview of larger businesses uh, in the entertainment or leisure activity. Uh, companies like Mecca, Mecca Bookmakers. That's how I came to start work with City Tote, who then combined with Williams and then got taken over by Mecca, which was a large company, uh, had a load of ballrooms and entertainment. Well, they were, they, at that time they were probably mostly um, bingo halls, but they had a large number of them anyway, and there was a big business. Uh, that business, incidentally, was run by Eric Morley at the time, who ran the Miss World contest. And I guess he's a scurrilous individual, but uh, he he was a very good employer to me. Um, uh, he introduced the incentive bonus scheme. Um, by which managers 
would get a percentage of the profits of a shop. And uh, I got a cheque for 800 and odd pounds one day, which was very nice. I, I would never have accumulated that money otherwise. Um, the sort of people, I, I did meet some interesting people in, in the course of that. People that had grown up in the old system before 1960. And one man was a guy called Patsy Ray. And uh, Patsy Ray didn't work really, really because he wanted the money. He didn't need the money. But he liked the atmosphere of a betting shop. And he, liked, he gravitated towards that kind of people. I guess he'd been in it all his life. And uh, one of Patsy's uh, stories was that uh, his main customer, his biggest customer, had been an employee of Lang, a building contractor. And over the years, this man had lost hundreds of thousands of pounds with Patsy. And Patsy Ray assumed, I suppose, that he owned Lang or he had a major share in it. But as it turned out, uh, what happened was that after some and his, his wife persuaded him that he needed a holiday. He hadn't had a holiday for decades and eventually he went on one. And as soon as somebody took over in the accounts department where he worked, they realised that he'd been swindling Lang out of hundreds of thousands of pounds over decades. And most of that money he lost with Patsy. But Patsy wasn't really very repentant about it. He, he said, well, you know, nobody forced him to gamble. I mean, it was, I, I, thought, he, I thought it was his money. I thought he owned Lang's Lake. Uh, another thing that, Pat, another story of Patsy's was that he, he owned a couple of dogs. He had, owned a couple of racing dogs. And um, he's apparently said one one of the ways in which you could you could not well there were two ways in which you could ensure that a dog didn't really perform as well as it was expected to one you could give it a good drink of water before the race so it would be carrying about a pound and a half of water and the other one was you could slip it a bit of chewing gum so that we when it was put in the traps and the, the hair came round on it, on its electric rail, this dog was <laughs> busily chewing on the chewing gum and couldn't get, didn't have the tongue or the teeth to get rid of it. And uh, when the traps opened and the dogs ran after the hair, this dog was was still trying to get the grips with the chewing gum. <laughs> didn't perform the way it should have done. Uh, another trick uh, he told me about was that uh, an expression I'm sure you've heard, let the dog see the rabbit. Well, what that meant was that before a race, uh, the, uh, the dog would, you would, sh uh, before the dog went into the traps for the race, you would show it a live rabbit. And the dog would get all excited I don't really want to eat that rabbit. But it would get in the traps. The hare would come round on its electric rail. Traps would open and the dogs would search forward. And this particular dog would be extra keen because it had just seen a rabbit and it wanted rabbit. Uh, it would run better than it would otherwise have done. And that, that's how... Uh, owners and trainers of animals and it applies to horses as well there are many tricks you can play with horses that's how they were able to benefit from the gaming system they had a better a better intelligence more information than the average punter and that's how they were able to win but uh, anyway this is the world I came into in 1969 and the work wasn't that much 
different from the work I'd been doing in the bank previously. It was just basically taking in money, paying out money, and adding up bits of paper with numbers on, and filling in forms and making the accounts match what you'd actually got at the end of the day. So uh, it was easy, and I was able in a short space of time to rise from a cashier to managing branches to managing larger branches and eventually um, I was able to go to a branch at a moment's notice and open the safe and start the business on the day which is a job I did for them. So anyway I'll tell you more about that next time I speak to you but for now that's that's the basics.